And the reason is because she is incredibly inspirational in well, as well as being incredibly insightful. A little, little background on those of you not familiar with Carlin. After a, a, earning an MBA and a PhD in psychology, Carlin set her sights on helping individuals and organizations to create more productive and fulfilling work experiences by combining orga organizational and positive psychology with mindfulness strategies. Carlin founded Zen Workplace in 2012. Website, zenworkplace.com. Carlin works with clients all over the world and focuses on helping those companies with their employee engagement, team resilience, and increasing productivity by changing the way they work together. Isn't that, isn't that refreshing? Working together to achieve a goal. Well, Carlin works with millions of individuals in our country. And this is where, what she does. She works with millions of individuals in trying to create a better environment for every person in our country by speaking the truth. ZenWorkplace.com. It's my honor to welcome back Dr. Carlin Barshenko. Carlin, welcome back to Operation Freedom. Thank you so much for having me back again, Dave. Well, it's an honor. So, Carolyn, let's Carolyn, let's start. Let's start with you two years ago. If I said to you two years ago, Carolyn, uh, in two years you're going to be doing all these walk away events, so walking away from the Democrat Party, from liberalism, from progressivism, that you would actually even be supporting President Trump. What would, what would you have said to me, Carolyn? I, I would have said to you that's not possible because I really <laughs> thought that the walk away movement was fake because that's what I heard on MSNBC. <laughs> So uh, in a nutshell, in a nutshell, what was the turning point that made Carlin say, wait a minute, uh, I need to reassess the battlefield here? Well, what it, it started in the most unlikely of places. It actually started in the knitting community, knitting the thing with the yarn and the needles. And, you know, what happened in the knitting community, and, and you know, I've been a knitter for 15 years, is that social justice started to come in and take over. And that's actually not uncommon. That has happened in pretty much every other community out there, from gaming to young adult fiction. You hear these horror stories of social justice warriors coming in and starting to bully and mob people for not using the right words or not, not bending the knee to them or things like that. Well, that happened almost two years ago now in the knitting community. And I saw so many good people have their reputations or their businesses destroyed because of the social justice mob. And I didn't understand what was happening, but I started looking into it and I realized at some point that these were people I had politically aligned myself with. And that realization made me start to question everything that I knew because I did not support what they were doing at all. And so I went on this journey of trying to challenge myself to listen to voices who I thought I would disagree with. And in fact, one of the very first things I watched was a walkaway town hall. Um, it was in New York City. It was with uh, Brandon Strzok and Mikey Harlow and Blair White, all, all three people I'm actually with right now in Florida currently. And I really was convinced I was going to disagree with everything they had to say. But actually, they sounded an awful lot like me. And then you actually went to a number of political events, both uh, on the D side of the equation, and I believe it was New Hampshire, and then you actually went to a Trump rally. I You're, did. So I, Educate I, us on your experiences there. Yeah, so I mean, living in New Hampshire, I'm always very spoiled during the primaries, and I get to see all the politicians up close. And so we found out Donald Trump was going to be coming to New Hampshire the day before the New Hampshire primary, and I thought, well, why not just go to a Trump rally? And, um, you know, that one rally ended up changing my life pretty significantly. And your experiences when you, you saw every Democrat candidate for the presidency, your experiences with them prior to that Trump rally? Oh, the Democrats, I mean, and we still see this with Joe Biden today, they're all about doom and gloom and America's a horrible place and aren't we horrible people for having grown up here with all this privilege? And, you know, to contrast that with the Trump rally, the Trump rally is like going to a rock concert. It's so fun. Everyone is in a great mood. Everyone is thrilled to be there. And Donald Trump is the consummate entertainer. Now, Carlin, let's talk about two of the candidates you actually saw in addition to President Trump. You saw Joe Biden live and you also saw Kamala Harris live, correct? I did. OK, your impressions of Biden and Kamala Harris when you saw them in New Hampshire. Well, you know, I back in September of last year, I was still vote blue no matter who I 
said, whoever the Democratic candidate is, I'm going to vote for them. It doesn't matter. Well, in September, I actually went to the New Hampshire State Democratic Convention where all the candidates were speaking. It was like a big deal. And Joe Biden was the very first one to speak. And I actually looked back at some notes I made uh, while I was sitting there, while I was speaking not too long ago. And what I wrote down was, he doesn't make sense. He's slurring his words. What has happened to Joe Biden? And that was really my impression at the time. And again, I was still very much a staunch Democrat. I, I planned to vote for whoever the nominee was. Um, but it just didn't seem to me like Joe Biden was altogether there. Now, if we look at Kamala Harris, Kamala was like, she wasn't even really present in New Hampshire, to be honest. I mean, she was there, but it was like, it was, she, you know, I don't want to be stereotypical, but but I'm good, it's the only word I can think to to really describe it. She's so unlikable. And even when she was, uh, you know, giving her speech and trying to advance her ideas, it was like, I think the crowd in New Hampshire at least had a very hard time wrapping their heads around it. Hmm. Then you started to experience the walkaway movement. Now, take us through your journey there, because you've gone to a number of events. You've flown around the country to be at these events. You've you've met uh, adversity. I was very worried about you, Carlin, when I watched video of... Uh, some uh, I would just characterize them as thugs uh, from um, Black Lives Matter and I guess Antifa chasing you in Dallas and actually yeah. uh, I would assaulting you. Yeah. Uh, uh, take us through what you have found over time as you've gone from city to city as far as your experiences with that. Well, I mean, first I'll start and I'll say this. Um, Brandon Schrock, who mm -hmm. was the founder of the Walkway Movement, he was one of the very first people to reach out to me when um, my my article about going to a Trump rally as a Democrat went viral and because I mentioned Walkway in the article. And so we had kind of connected very early on in my journey and he invited me to start participating in these Rescue America rallies that he was doing around the country. And really the whole idea of the Walkaway Rescue America rallies is that we wanted to be voices to say that we do do not agree with what the left is doing to this country with the looting and the rioting and the violence and we wanted there to be voices out there that were expressing those ideas you know the only people who were really protesting or doing anything at that point were black lives matter and so brandon kind of took things into his own hands and said okay well we're going to provide a little bit of opposition and so we've actually been traveling around almost every weekend for the last few months all over the country we've been to baltimore philadelphia chicago um all sorts of all, all sorts of different cities, and we've definitely had some adventures. That's for sure. The most uh, the, the the most uh, pushback you had was was that in Dallas. Yeah, that was definitely in Dallas. And to be honest, like you know, I want to be clear for everyone: we actually haven't had a lot of pushback at a lot of our rallies. We actually had a thousand people, Dave, in Beverly Hills <laughs> of all places. <laughs> And it was like one of the most glorious days ever. But, you know, we have had some pushback at these rallies in Chicago. We had Black Lives Matter protesters that were trying to beat drums to drown us out. Now, what was ironic about Chicago is all the Black Lives Matter protesters were white oh. and many of our speakers were black. So the white folk were literally drowning out the black voices, which I thought was pretty ironic. Um, but probably the the biggest thing that we had happened to us was in Dallas and it started where um, a Black Lives Matter group came to our rally. Their their whole goal of coming to our rally was to disrupt it, to end the rally. Now, we have security at all our rallies. They're all very safe. But the leader of the Black Lives Matter group actually assaulted one of our security guards. And so the security guard kind of put him on the ground to stop it. And unfortunately, both of them ended up getting arrested. Well, several hours later, the police still had not released our security guard. And so a group of us went down to the police station to see what was going on and to provide our support. And when we got there, I mean, this is directly in front of the Dallas police station. There were a bunch of Black Lives Matter protesters, but there was also a big line of media. And so we, we basically decided to um, just walk up to the media. Brandon wanted to provide a different side of the story than what the Black Lives Matter protesters were telling them. And we really didn't think they were gonna do anything directly in front of the police station with a line of media there. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were wrong. And as soon as we started to approach the police station, they surrounded us. They started throwing things at us. They started chasing us down the street. Um, the cops would not help us. The cops were completely in the pockets of Black Lives Matter. We even called 911 and they wouldn't send anyone after us. 
Um, so we ended up being chased about four or five blocks down the street to where there were a couple of police cruisers stationed. And finally, they stopped chasing us after that. But I have to say that that, that was one of the most terrifying moments of my life. Um, one of the members of the walkaway staff actually had his phone stolen and broken because he was filming it. They, they assaulted me. They tried to steal my phone. Mm-hmm. Luckily, I, I snaked it away from them. They didn't get it. Um, so it was terrifying, and I'm, I'm really glad to not have to go back to Dallas anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, let, what, what events are on the schedule for the walkaway movement? I believe uh, Omaha is coming up, correct, this week? Oma- yeah, Omaha is coming up next week, um, next next uh, Saturday, I believe. And um, I believe they're going to be adding another event in Atlanta right before the weekend before the election. So that, that will probably be an interesting one as well. Now, do you normally find at these walkaway uh, uh, events that there are people that have, have been kind of disenchanted with what's been going on on the left side of the equation? And how, how, what do they do? They approach you and say, well, talk to us a little more about this. Or how does that how does that transformation? How does that interaction occur? Well, there, there are all sorts of people that attend walkaway events. Certainly there are Trump supporters and conservatives that attend walkaway events to show their support. But there are an awful lot of people who come and have this- stories that are very similar than that to mine they come up and they say you know i left the democratic party i see what's going on i'm not comfortable with it and so i i really think the democrats are in for quite a surprise i don't think they really understand how many people they've driven away from the party and i don't care what the polls say i'm out there every single week seeing people talking to people hearing their stories and it's the same story over and over and over again in every single city that we go to now let's talk about some of these debates. Uh, you're a, you are a PhD in, in psychology. You are well recognized around our country, around the world. Uh, let's 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 uh, talk about the first presidential debate briefly. Much like a goat rodeo, um, President Trump was accused of interrupting. Yet it was Biden who interrupted President Trump. Uh, three times, uh, about uh, three minutes into the debate. What was your take on that on that event? You know, I think Trump dominated that mm-hmm. first debate. I mean, there was no doubt to me who was in charge of that room. And Trump wasn't even just debating Biden. No. Trump was also debating the moderator. He was debating Chris Wallace. So it was like two, to two against one. Now, what I will say is that I really wish and I, I do hope that final debate actually happens because I think that Trump maybe went a little too aggressive. I think it was like he was so dominant in that debate that it was it was like almost overwhelming. It was like seeing a fight on a schoolyard where where one person has obviously won the fight and then they just keep kicking the guy while they're down. And I think what happened is people started to feel sorry for Biden because he did so terribly in that debate and the contrast was so stark. Um, So I think Trump could rein back the aggression just a little bit. But also, I think that Trump has an opportunity to really talk about what he has actually done. Yes. You know, stop getting into these fights. Stop yeah. bickering with the moderator and with Biden. Talk about your policies. Talk about what you want to do. Because if he talks about those things, he has got a lot to talk about. Well, and in fact, Carlin, it's interesting you bring that up. Because this past week, uh, on October 15th, there was this town hall setting. And Savannah Guthrie from NBC was obviously put on point to try to not only debate him, but try to uh, bait President Trump to take him out, and he did. He did not fall for that. He actually was explaining the things that they had done over the past three and a half years. I thought he was very successful in that. I thought Savannah Guthrie looked incredibly, really bad in that. And in fact, I thought he he actually uh, was. It was an a, a incredibly big victory for him that night. What was your take? Yeah, no, I agree. I think Savannah Guthrie came across as really, I mean, just very poorly in that setting. I mean, her job was not to debate Trump. Her job was to moderate a town hall and hopefully give the actual voters a chance to ask their questions. And she didn't do that. She turned it into a fight with Trump. Now, I have to agree with you. I think that I loved that Trump pushed back 
on some of the things that she said. I love that Trump pushed back on this assertion that he's never denounced white supremacy. Uh, he has yeah. denounced white supremacy repeatedly, <laughs> like for years. Um, I love that he said, like, why isn't Joe Biden being asked about Antifa? I, I think that Trump did very well. I, I still think there's improvements to be made, though, um, in terms of talking about policy. And frankly, I would like to see Mike Pence really prep Trump for the final debate because well, Mike Pence is a good debater. <laughs> oh, wait, so let's talk about that. Uh, the, the, the vice presidential debate, it, we know it was a disaster for the globalists, for the progressives, because they don't want to talk about it. Even here in the People's Republic of Ann Arbor, they don't want to talk about it, which tells me how really bad even they thought uh, Harris did in that. Uh, but what was your take on that debate? Because uh, it show, you know, it, it, it goes along with what you said earlier when you saw her that she was not likable. What was your take on the presidential debate? Our, uh, so for the vice presidential debate, you mean? Yes. Uh, so I, I think, you know, I, I should say, I should start this by saying I have never been a fan of Mike Pence. No, I have and, never, and you know what? I, I'm, I haven't been either. I haven't been either. Yeah. yeah. I and, and, you know, I came around to Trump, but I hadn't yet come around to Pence. But I have to say he won me over. He did. Now, there are still definite disagreements I have with him, but Mike Pence was was what I want Donald Trump to be in the next debate. He was the adult in the room. He explained the policies. He explained everything calmly and rationally. I mean, Kamala wants to make it seem like Mike Pence was like mansplaining and interrupting. He really wasn't. In fact, Kamala was interrupting him. There were people who were actually like tracking the timers and found that the moderator of the debate would would try to cut Mike Pence off before his time was done. And then Kamala would jump right in on his time while he was still answering the question. So I thought that what Mike Pence did was incredibly effective. And frankly, I thought Kamala looked ill prepared in comparison. Well, and she also and, and this was compounded with the I don't know if you saw it, uh, Carlin, but the a Amy Coney Barrett uh, uh, hearings. Uh, there she was, uh, Harris, reading her teleprompter. Uh, in another room, uh, and, and then asking questions. And a Amy Coney Barrett, uh, with her blank le uh, notepad in front of her and no other, no other uh, references, um, essentially took her apart. Yeah, Kamala was so petty in those e hearings with ACB. I mean, when she went into this line of like, do you believe that COVID is infectious? And <laughs> yeah. do you believe I mean, I, I was like, what are you doing? I mean, because, you know, Amy Coney Barrett was so smart in those hearings. She was so composed. I was incredibly impressed with her. And she just shot she didn't fall for any of their tricks. And I think I frankly think not just Kamala, but many of the Democrats in that hearing, they looked like petulant children who were being taken out to school by mother. <laughs> so, Carolyn, you have your finger on the pulse. You've been all over our country. You've spoken to many thousands of individuals. Um, what's your take on what's going to happen on November 3rd? You know, Dave, like a lot of people are saying that it's going to be close. And I don't think that anyone should take anything for granted. I think that if Trump loses, it will be because of hubris with thinking that his victory is absolutely assured. But at the same time, I think that Trump is going to win. And I think he's, it's not going to be a small win. I think he is going to landslide. I really do. Um, you know, everything that I've seen on the ground all over the country. And remember, like, Walkaway is going to Democratic places. We're not going to Republican places. No, We're you going go right into enemy territory. We do. We do. We are unabashed about it. And and what I'm seeing there is people who are showing up who are saying that, you know, Donald Trump isn't so bad. He's actually OK. And Joe Biden is not equipped right now to lead this country. The dude can't even form a full sentence. And, you know, so I think that Trump is going to do very, very well. We also saw some interesting data, I think, in the last week or so that's saying that when people get called uh, from pollsters, they're lying to them, especially independents and Republicans. They're not admitting that they're voting for Donald Trump. So I don't think people should pay any attention to the polls. I do think that everyone needs to get out and vote in person if you absolutely can to make sure that there are as many votes as possible. Because if Donald Trump landslides, that is the absolute best way to ensure that the Democrats don't try to steal the election. That's right. Obviously, with uh, a huge turnout uh, in his favor, there is no way that they, the Biden-Harris people 
can cheat enough or manipulate enough to even get it to a point where they can cause, uh, if you will, uh, uh, a a prolonged multi-week uh, extravaganza of stealing votes. Yeah, absolutely. And Dave, have you seen these articles that have started to come out on the Democratic side recently saying they're basically retracting their position on mail-in voting because I think they're assessing that Democrats don't know how to properly mail in vote and aren't going to follow the instructions correctly. So now they're saying, no, 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 don't don't mail in vote. Make sure you vote in person or you vote absentee because your vote might not get counted if you do mail in voting. <laughs> it, uh, it's it's very interesting, right? Because they yeah. were all behind that. They were all behind that several three weeks ago, two, two three, four weeks ago. And now all of a sudden it's falling by the wayside. I, I have a quote here from Dr. Mike Rechtenwald, uh, who's called the anti-PC professor, used to be at NYU. I'd like your take on it. Here's what he says. A quote, the more dangerous virus infecting America is ideological, not biological. Now remember, Mike Rechtenwald, Carlin, was someone who was left of the Bolsheviks at one point in his career. Oh. Now is a freedom fighter. He went on to say this. This virus turns people into mutant miscreants, sick with envy, hatred, mass delirium, homicidal ideation, and violent tendencies accompanied by an irrational belief in their own moral superiority, end quote. Yeah, I think that that quote perfectly describes the Black Lives Matter people that attacked us in Dallas. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is not I, I'm not exaggerating when I say to look into their eyes, you feel like you're looking at something demonic. That's really mm -hmm. like, it, it looks like these people look like they're possessed. And I think that we are, we're dealing with forces that are frankly much more powerful than all of us. And that's why it's incumbent upon every, everyone. If you can speak up, if you can fight back, you know, you don't need to go out to rallies like I am and, you know, travel the country doing this. You don't need to do that. But if you can speak up and just share your values and share why you think it's important to protect our fundamental liberties in this country, that's important. What I've been telling people at these walkaway rallies is things like freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, and, and you know, the Second Amendment being necessary to protect all of those, those are not conservative values. Those are American values. 